Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this one hour webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to let the audience know that this webinar is being recorded and a video recording will be emailed to you in a few days. And there's a link to the chat that are uh, it, to the slides that are currently available in the chat. And I'm Abby Schachner. I'm a senior researcher with the Learning Policy Institute. And during this webinar, we're going to discuss opportunities for policymakers, educators, and advocates to more fully understand the depths of the inequities of the COVID-19 has laid bare and the ways in which this moment holds the possibility to rethink school in ways that can transform learning and close opportunity and achievement gaps. We will begin by sharing some insights from LPI's recently released report, Restarting and Reinventing School, Learning in the Time of COVID and Beyond, and then move into our discussion with our esteemed panelists. And as a reminder, if you have any questions, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'm gonna now turn it over to Linda Darling-Hammond, LPI's exceptional president and CEO. Thanks, Abby. Um, we are going to, um, there we are. <laughs> We're going to take a very brief moment to just review this uh, report that Abby mentioned, and then we've got a, an exceptional panel of um, uh, people who from all parts of the leadership uh, in this country to really respond to it. Uh, I'm going to see if this moves ahead. We are in an extraordinary moment. Uh, a moment of both a public health crisis, an economic crisis, a civil rights crisis, uh, raising up important issues of systemic racism in, in our country. And in California, we're seeing uh, every day now the, the extent of the climate crisis. Uh, and in such moments, these come generationally. We often get very large uh, social movements and change that are the result of the degree to which uh, the conditions in the environment and in the society disrupt what we have come to know. Uh, you can think about the 1870s and Reconstruction. You can think about the turn of the century, uh, the 1930s, when the Great Depression led to uh, the creation of a wide range of social policies. We experience today the 1960s, when civil rights marches and protests as well as a set of assassinations led to uh, sweeping uh, policies for equity uh, and for reducing poverty in this country. Uh, today we are in such a moment where the question is not only how do we come together to deal with this set of crises, but how do we reinvent uh, our society and our systems uh, in ways that bring us back uh, stronger we have yawning equity chasms that threaten major segments of society, as Abby said, and draw attention uh, to really generations of uh, systemic racism and inequality. We have the largest economic disparities since 1929. Uh, the top 1% of uh, wealth holders in this country have more wealth than the bottom 50% combined. We have inadequate action right now to address the health, safety, and economic effects of the pandemic. And of course, schools as one of the few safety nets in many hard hit communities are experiencing that. Uh, when the schools were closed in the spring, you know, it was the uh, educators all across the country who stepped up to be sure that students would get fed, that their families would get fed to figure out how to get uh, devices and connectivity to students to try to close the digital divide and try to invent new ways of doing schooling. And we're seeing the results of that in all of the months since. And some amazing uh, innovations have occurred, some incredible uh, creativity about how to address these needs has occurred. And we see people beginning to share those across the country. Uh, we'll need a great deal more of that if we're going to address all of the needs that currently exist. Uh, the uh, effects of the pandemic, of course, have been uh, most uh, felt and uh, hardest hit in communities of color, uh, why students of color are uh, primed to be left behind in the coronavirus is the type of uh, headline that you often see, uh, the inequities facing English learners, 
the digital divide for students. Uh, we also see the learning pods that wealthy parents are creating for their students. Um, we're seeing uh, layoffs uh, and a loss of teaching jobs because of the economic uh, hit to state revenues. So all of these things sort of frame the way in which we uh, are experiencing this crisis. These are two little girls sitting outside of Taco Bell trying to get Wi-Fi to do their school schoolwork in California. Uh, that's just a vivid reminder of the disparities that uh, children experience uh, in many, many ways across the country. As this Oakland student put it, I'm concerned about food, jobs, money, my education. Racism toward Asian Pacific Islander folks is a big concern for us too. I miss being around my friends. I'm really, really depressed. I can't really tell my family. So this is the situation that a lot of <clears throat> students are experiencing and that educators are uh, trying to address as kids are coming back to school. Some are coming back online, some in hybrid, um, different kind of hybrid strategies, some in person, uh, but as we know, it's variable from day to day and week to week, how uh, educators and children will work together uh, to try to promote both education, but also social and emotional well-being uh, and physical health and wellness, uh, which are at the front of uh, every educator's mind as they're working with children. So we have all of this to contend with. And at the same time, uh, school is not the same as it has been, and we're reinventing every aspect of it. We're reinventing pedagogies, uh, strategies, outreach, family, school connections, and many other things. And what our report talks about is how reinventing school uh, in this moment uh, really means focusing on authentic learning and equity, harnessing the knowledge of human development, learning and effective teaching that's accumulated over the last century and needed for the next. Uh, we invented the school system we have today about 100 years ago uh, in the 1920s. Uh, a lot of that invention of the mass assembly line approach to education because of compulsory education coming online at that time occurred in New York City and we will hear from the current Chancellor of Education in New York City where uh, in the last few decades, many of those schools have been in the process of being redesigned and reinvented. We've learned things about how to reach and teach children more effectively that we can put in place as we reinvent the system in this moment. I'm going to pass the ball to um, Abby. Great, thank you, Linda. So I'm gonna provide a brief overview of the overarching framework. And the framework that we have in the report provides 10 interlocking priorities for restarting and reinventing for equity and empowerment. And each of them is grounded in research and accompanied by recommendations examples and resources for policymakers and educators at the federal, state, and local levels, and spans early childhood through secondary schooling. And each one of these elements of the framework has a strong equity and racial justice component. So now I'm just gonna pretty quickly walk you through each one of them before we dig into the deeper discussion with the panel. So the first set relates to getting back to school. Uh, closing the digital divide is obviously a critical civil rights issue for children and families, and this is the time to close it once and for all through equitable access to both connectivity and high-speed internet and devices. And federal investments and coordinated state-level efforts are key to this. And there are existing opportunities through the FCC's E-rate program, for example, that could be capitalized upon and expanded. And there are efforts from states that have been leading the way, like Wyoming, that others can learn from. Strengthening distance and blended learning is another priority, and it's imperative that we take advantage of the knowledge that we have from research on how to do this well, which we summarize in the report, so that we can do it in a way that closes the opportunity gap rather than exacerbating it further. And draw upon lessons from pioneering districts like Lindsay Unified in California and Miami-Dade. And then we also need to assess what students need by taking stock of their recent experiences in terms of their health, mental health, and academic learning in ways that are strength-based rather than deficit-oriented 
and diagnostic in nature, seeing where kids are on a trajectory of learning and identifying the ways uh, to accelerate their learning rather than thinking about labeling and sorting and tracking and remediation and labeling them as at, below, or above. And this really requires a different concept of assessment and how it relates to supports for social emotional learning and the kind of academic supports that are going to really empower students. The next set of priorities relate to transforming teaching and learning. Um, ensuring supports for social emotional learning is more important now than ever and there's broad recognition of this. Um, and we provide some examples of ways that this can be done, but it's really key to integrate these practices into the life of the school and find a dedicated place and space to also support explicit social emotional learning for adults and as students as well. And these supports can be need to be accompanied by educative and restorative practices that help create a sense of membership and a sense of belonging and a community for students rather than an environment that's punitive or exclusionary. That can really undermine uh, schools' efforts to support social emotional learning otherwise. There's also a real opportunity to redesign schools for stronger relationships because the cohort designs that are being put into place to safely reopen schools to present, prevent disease transmission and prevent COVID from spreading within a school also help to build caring relationships where there are small groups of students and teachers that stay together teams of teachers that share students. And when this is paired with other structures that enable continuity in relationships like looping and advisories that last for multiple years, schools really have the chance to put into place long-standing redesigns that research has shown translate into more equitable academic success and where students are more understood and also more able to cope with trauma and stress. Emphasizing authentic and culturally responsive learning is happening more and is needed more than ever to motivate and engage learners during this time, particularly during distance and hybrid learning. And this involves connecting lessons to real world applications and the things that students care about and that are happening in the world around them, encouraging them to bring their identities into the classroom, doing hands on projects and presentations of their work. And we also know that this type of student driven learning can happen both in person and virtual settings. In all of these areas, preparing educators for reinventing schools in these ways is really important for this to happen. And they need to be able to be prepared to bring a racially just perspective and have the tools and the skills to enact racially just and socially just practices. And there's really also an opportunity to connect educators to one another more easily and provide more opportunities for collaboration and professional learning and planning time with changes to school schedules. And with these shifts, we have the chance to provide educators this additional eight hours that the US lacks in comparison to other countries. And the last set relate to rethinking time and resources. So providing expanded learning time for all students can really mitigate instructional loss including high quality summer programs like the Children's Defense Fund's Freedom Schools, tutoring that's infused during and beyond the school day, connections with high quality after school programs that really extend learning, and full day early learning programs are also a form of expanded learning. And there should be special attention paid to providing opportunities for accelerating learning for students with special education needs, English learners, and students who have been disconnected from school during the pandemic. Establishing community schools and wraparound supports really is implied by all of this and the community schools really offer a path forward for supporting and meeting the social emotional and other needs of students across the education spectrum from early childhood to high school. And that's because community schools are designed to address systemic barriers to education like poverty or housing insecurity and to draw upon a community's assets and culture and they prioritize relationships with family members. And because they do this, when COVID-19 hit, they had the relationships and the infrastructures in place to really be able to respond quickly and meaningfully and mobilize their supports and services and connect with their students and families in ways that other schools were not poised to do. And lastly, leveraging more adequate and equitable school funding. I know this may be tough to think about when resources are low, but there's also an opportunity right now for states to adopt new funding formulas that are designed to distribute funds more equitably 
as resources eventually return to the system. And this can actually be easier to do during an economic downturn, as we've seen California, Maryland, and Rhode Island do during and after the Great Recession. And with that, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it back over to Linda to go deeper into these issues with our wonderful panelists. Um, can you go back a, uh, one um, slide? Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the parents in Atlanta Public Schools really put it uh, well. Uh, she said, reprioritize. This is the time to see if something can be different. To reset the system, we have to take a loss but we can recoup the loss if we actually get kids excited about education and create a more positive space for them to learn. And I saw in the Q&A box, you know, the desired shift from sort of a um, top-down regulatory approach to one that is more humanistic. And I think that is one of the things that is front and center in uh, many people's consciousness in the field right now. So with that, I'm going to uh, ask our panelists to come on uh, the screen. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce them briefly. Uh, John King is the president and CEO of the Education Trust, a national nonprofit organization that um, seeks to identify and close opportunity and achievement gaps from preschool through college. John served in President Barack Obama's cabinet as the 10th U.S. Secretary of Education. Before that position, he was a, the New York State Education Commissioner. He began his career in education as a high school social studies teacher in Puerto Rico and Boston and a middle school principal. John, thanks so much for being with us. Um, I see Richard on the screen and I'm gonna introduce him next. Yeah, I realized I was thinking about this, all of us have spent time in New York City. So <laughs> it's an interesting connection. Uh, Richard is chancellor of the New York City Department of Education which created the factory model school and has been busy dismantling it in the last couple of decades. It's the largest school system in the nation. He's responsible for educating 1.1 million students in over 1,800 schools, um, most of which are open right now, although it's a back and forth process uh, as we deal with this pandemic. Uh, prior to this position, Richard served in the San Francisco Unified School District, where we got to know each other. He was a superintendent, began his career as a high school bilingual social studies and music teacher, then as a principal, both in Tucson, Arizona. He started school as an English language learner and continues to play in a mariachi band when he's not leading the uh, New York City public schools. And I'm thrilled that Randy Weingarten has been able to join us from a bus uh, traveling across the country. Thank you, Randy, that is above and beyond the call of duty. Randy is president of the American Federation of Teachers, which represents 1.7 million teachers, school-based staff, and other professionals. The AFT champions fairness, democracy, economic opportunity, and high-quality public education, healthcare, and public services for students, their families, and communities. Before her election as AFT president, Randy served as 12 year, for 12 years as president of the United Federation of Teachers uh, in New York City. Uh, so welcome. Uh, what an amazing panel of folks, all of whom have been involved in various ways over the course of their careers in reinventing public education, and all of whom are deeply involved right now in this moment in both dealing with the uh, challenges and the inequities that we face, but also trying to do that in ways that move us forward in our understanding of how to serve children humanistically and well. I'm going to start with you, John, um, and ask about the inequalities that we've been seeing in the system and in, uh, in the midst of the crises I described. Uh, what are some of the things that you're seeing in your current role at EdTrust uh, as um, you know, results of the pandemic and what you think we need to be doing about those? Sure. Well, thanks for the opportunity to join the conversation, Linda. Uh, as, as you said in the framing, I mean, COVID has in many ways exacerbated the inequalities that existed before COVID. Uh, and it's done so not only in schools, but for children and families. We know, for example, that Black and Latino folks are three times as likely to get COVID, twice as likely to die from COVID when they get it. Uh, Black and Latino communities have borne the brunt of the economic crisis that COVID-19 has created. Uh, it's had a disparate impact on employment and income. 
all of that impacts kids, of course. And then when we think about uh, what that economic impact looks like for kids and families, we have to acknowledge we have 14 million kids who are food insecure. Kids who are now are, have a harder time getting food at school when school is closed in the spring or school is either closed now or operating in a hybrid model now. So those are challenges for families. In terms of educational challenges, as, as you highlighted in the opening, we had a digital divide before COVID, um, a digital divide that translated into a lack of internet access. The Pew study shows us 79% of white families have reliable internet access, just 66% of uh, African-American families and 61% of Latino families. So folks couldn't even access school in the spring when we had to go to virtual and there are still families today because the federal government has not stepped up in, a ne in the necessary way, there are still families today that can't get online to access education. There are still teachers around the country who can't get reliable internet service. Uh, we, we have a device gap Folks like Richard have done incredible work to try to get devices out to students and families, but we know there are still kids who are doing their schoolwork on mom's phone because they don't have a device available to them for their schoolwork. Low resource districts struggle to provide professional development for their teachers around using the technology as a teaching tool. Um, low income students are more likely to be in homes where there were other challenges, uh, whether it's issues of addiction or issues of abuse, and then they've been isolated for months when schools were, were uh, all virtual in the spring and in many places around the country schools are still operating virtual or hybrid and kids are socio-emotionally isolated. Uh, so these are huge challenges. We also know only about uh, one in five African Americans in the workforce can work from home. Only about one in six Latinos in the workforce can work from home. So for many families of color, it's very difficult to provide support during the day to their kids as they go through school. So the learning gaps have been widened. The socio-emotional isolation has taken a toll on kids and parents. Uh, so this, this last uh, several months has been an equity disaster. It didn't have to be that way. The federal government completely mishandled COVID-19. And so here we are with these tremendous challenges. And I'm grateful to be in this conversation about how we try to meet those. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, uh, the, of the federal recovery aid to date, almost $3 trillion, less than 1% has been directed at K through 12 schools. So states, districts have been trying to step up in all the ways that they can. Um, and of course, the, you know, some of this uh, urgency and some of the uh, obviousness of the inequality has spurred some action. In California, we were somewhere between 20 and 30% of our students lacking connectivity and devices. We've closed that digital divide by more than half at this point and we'll probably close it this year because we finally got mobilized. Um, well, both with philanthropy and um, corporations stepping up, Google and Apple and others, but also because of the way in which we were able to direct, you know, public funds to that purpose. But uh, in the meantime, it has been, you know, just enormously challenging. I want to just give Randy and uh, Richard an opportunity if they want to say anything about the ways in which people are addressing some of these needs. Um, before we switch to some of the other topics. Richard, do you want to speak to that? Sure. So it's, uh, it's always hard following the eloquent John King and Randy Weingarten. So thanks for putting me in the middle, because then I have a fighting chance on this one. Uh, but look, historically underserved communities became more underserved during this pandemic. And as you so rightfully have pointed out, we are battling at least three pandemics, the viral pandemic, COVID-19, the economic pandemic that's associated with that, and the abject um, failure of the federal government to intercede and provide any kind of leadership, not only directional leadership, but also the financial leadership that we need to bring schools back in a safe and secure way. And then you add to that the racial pandemic that is uh, across the world, the recognition of systemic racism and uh, the- Okay, the let's try it again. Generations of, of students. It is no wonder that we see the disproportionate impact in our communities of color. We are very clearly here in New York City. 
I would say in New York City, uh, it's one of the reasons why it was so important for us, as long as medically feasible and advisable for us to bring back in-person learning, even if it's a modicum of in-person learning, because we understand that there are children that are still falling through the cracks and that the achievement opportunity gap is, is increasing exponentially for many of our students. That's why during the, the height of the pandemic in New York City, we created the regional enrichment centers, which were centers to care for and educate the children of first responders and medical personnel because they were on the front lines. We were able to, in those regional education centers, working very closely with our labor partners, establish health and safety protocols so that we had not one student or adult become infected during the height of the pandemic here in New York City, where we were truly the epicenter of the epicenter. So when we work together, we've been able to prove that we can not only mitigate some of these disastrous effects of the pandemic, but it also gives us a path forward for what could that new normal look like post COVID-19. Yeah, that's great. Randy, um, I heard you for a second there. You're on mute, but if you can come off of mute, we'd love to- I am back. If you wanna <laughs> add any um, thoughts on this question, and then I'm gonna direct another one to you about the nature of the teaching and learning that we're engaged in. So I would just say, you know, whatever both John and Richard said, um, you know, now, now that I see it around the country, multiply it by 5,000. So just think about, and John, you know, John and I really pushed very hard to see if we could get summer school. We needed, um, you know, we needed resources. The president refused to really negotiate. I just saw a tweet that said that he's not going to negotiate any, anything further. But, you know, if you just think about all the different um, uh, crises that you listed, Linda. So um, I'm a kid with asthma who doesn't have um, internet at home. Maybe I'm you know, in a rural area or in an urban area. 16 million kids like that don't have internet right now still, even with all the work that Richard and others have done. Um, I don't have books at home. Um, and I'm pretty socially isolated because I couldn't be outside, you know, for a long time, we didn't realize that outside was better than inside. And so, and then if we don't have grab and goes, I'm not eating like I did in, in school. So you have all of the primal needs that were like, we had a five alarm fire. And then on top of that, take the places where there were fires, like Oregon, Washington, um, uh, California, you could see the fires um, all the way into Ohio. So I would say that every kind of Maslowian need has kind of exposed itself right now. And I want to actually go back then to where you started, Linda, in terms of that's why I thought your 10 points, Learning Policy Institute's 10 points are so important. And, and they are actually baked in, in a real way, to the Biden-Harris and democratic platform because there's a shift to instead of being top-down test-based accountability based there's a shift to kind of thinking about the the whole child and addressing children's needs starting with social and emotional learning as well as well-being and then using that portal as a way to dealing with um, instruction, like through project-based learning and relationship-based things. So I would say the inequities are huge. It's going to take, hopefully after a vaccine, it's going to take a year or so to try to figure this out. But mm -hmm. I would actually push for rap using, and you have this as your number, um, your number eight, <laughs> using community schools all throughout the country yeah. as a vehicle and infrastructure by which to do a lot of the other things that we have to do. Because we need an infrastructure to do these things, including extended learning, including following every single child, including having the supports. But I watch, and, and, and one of your, and, the, and I'll shut up here, one of your um, associates as you were, as, you know, we saw that the, that the schools 
that either had capstone exper experiments or project-based learning and or the schools that had community schooling and wraparound services, they were able to mitigate the inequities better than any other school. Yeah, yeah, we did see that. And just for those who may be new to the idea of community schools, you know, these are schools that have either on-site or connections to health and mental health resources, social services. There's usually a community school manager who can integrate all those services for the kids and the families so that it's not just getting um, social and emotional supports to kids who are in traumatic situations. It's also, also solving the traumatic situations for a lot of families. You know, if you're on the verge of eviction, there's somebody there who knows how to get the services that you need to you know have a place to stay etc so uh, community schools you know, are long standing but we have seen that the places that had them um there are not enough of them but really were able to step up and take care of families in in this moment in a different way randy you mentioned and since we've got you uh with good audio for the moment i'm gonna stick with you for uh this moment you mentioned uh, the fact that the kids were involved in project-based learning during the pandemic, they were already doing inquiry. They already had their projects underway. They were presenting on Zoom to each other uh, the results. Uh, state engaged had a meaningful experience and the AFT also yep. uh, produced a sort of a project-based uh, capstone project uh, resource that a lot of people used in that time. Uh, what do you think that states and districts can be doing to promote the kind of learning that's meaningful for students uh, that will, you know, make them want to be connected to school uh, and enable them to develop those skills during this time. So, um, so, I, so I think we, again, we have learned a lot in this situation, I mean, in this crisis, about what works to engage and what doesn't work to engage. And I think it is time to actually really rethink the assessment processes up and down the line. Um, you know, we tried to do that in ESSA, but because there was so many kind of constraints on project-based learning and portfolio assessments, not a lot of schools did it. But this is a moment of time this year to do these things. And I would also advise that hopefully we'll have a new president and we will um, figure out a waiver process of the standardized tests this year and really do what we did at, at the beginning of ESSA, which is to create some kind of way for states to do this kind of project-based inquiry. Because so, so what, what, what states can do is four things that are really important right now. Number one, really thinking about relational learning and with the smaller pods and the smaller um, classes, really thinking about how to do relational type learning. Number two, understanding that we still need ongoing professional development because remote is really, really, really different than in school and a hybrid takes, people are exhausted already. Hybrid takes a lot of different kind of, 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 of pedagogy to actually engage kids. So we have to have a lot more of this ongoing professional development and well-being for teachers as well as for kids right now. Number three, I think we should be really thinking about capstone or project-based learning as a summative way, developmentally appropriate, but as a summative, uh, as a as a way of actually capping the year for virtually all kids, um, I I am not giving up on the second semester of this year, but it has been, and I give Richard and New York City a lot of credit. Um, I have been very engaged in that process, but it was really important to try to figure out how to stand things up. But you're going to have weeks where schools are going to go back to remote and weeks where they're going to be in school and you're going to have all of this disruption. So I think that the issue of trying to figure out what do we want at the end for kids to know and be able to do and then back map it, particularly for the second semester is really important and that can be a state issue. So it's relational based. 
um, well-being, what do we want kids to know and be able to do at the end of the year, back map it, and then also have a lot of, of professional development this year. All of that can be done right now by states as advice to districts and to teachers and to principals all across America who really, really, really are desperate for it. Yeah. You know, you're making me remember that in the 1990s under IASA, which was an earlier version of uh, federal law, um, a lot of states did have both sit down tests, you know, where kids would, you know, um, uh, reveal what they know in that way, but they would also have project based uh, assessments that, you know, you think about Delaware and Maryland and um, yeah, Vermont, Vermont and Connecticut and Kentucky where there was a writing portfolio and kids were, you know, entering things in the writing portfolio. Teachers learned how to score that in a reliable way so it could be part of the work that they were doing in classrooms. Um, that we did make some headway on this idea of really authentic learning and assessment along with sit-down tests that could be combined into uh, measures yep. of broader learning. And um, we're poised to really re-engage that question of how do we assess so that we both have the comparable data that we ultimately need, but also have the kind of learning we want kids to be engaged in. Um, Richard, I'm gonna come to you and just note that, you know, New York City has long been the home of a lot of innovation in teaching and learning over many years. Uh, and I wonder if you uh, could speak to important innovations that you've seen uh, in response to the pandemic uh, in, in the city. So I think all of us and, and my colleagues and, and everyone across the country in public education was really thrust into a whole new way of thinking in March, um, February, March, and definitely April. And in New York City, we've learned a lot since we had a remote uh, switch to remote learning March 15th. I'll never forget that day. Uh, and I give a lot of credit to our educators and our students and our parents because in a matter of days, we had to convert an entire system from what we knew and were experienced in experiencing into a completely new way of teaching and learning and being. Um, so we've learned a lot from that. And, you know, when you think of innovation, I could, I could talk about, for example, uh, the Williamsburg High School for Architecture and Design in Brooklyn. They designed uh, and developed a plan to redesign the town of Lake Como, New Jersey. And they presented it to the town council, the city council, and many of those elements were adopted into that new design. I mean, we would think of that as being innovative, but I'm going to take this on in a little slightly little different way. Think about what we've not done since March that we always considered to be part of the system that we did in public education. Since March, we have not suspended any students from school. Think about that. In March, we have not uh, had students go through any uh, metal detectors or have a police presence in schools. Think about that. Since March, we have not applied punitive teacher evaluation systems to teachers. Think about that. Since March, we have uh, not only lifted, but integrated um, social emotional learning and trauma informed curricula and pedagogy into the very nature of what we do as part of what we do for educating children. And we've recognized that not only have children suffered trauma, but the adults that kill the children have suffered trauma. So how do we pay attention to that? Think about since March, we've done more to address the digital divide than we've done in the last three decades in mm -hmm. the United States. America. We all know that there's more to do. Think about it, and I can speak about it from here in New York City, where the traditional uh, narrative was that it's, it's management and labor. Well, I can tell you that in New York City, it's been management and labor working together to make sure we have safe, secure physical environments, that we have testing protocols, that we have school facilities set up so that we're successful in terms of educating our students, and that we're uh, working together to address issues of educational uh, continuity of learning for our children. So those students that are learning remotely should not have a markedly different experience than children that are in a blended experience where they have a few days in the building and then a few days in a remote experience. 
So then how do we create those systems and structures so that the blended learning teachers are collaborating? I'm gonna clutch my pearls here, because what? Time to collaborate? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Collaborate, coordinate, so that you have educational continuity that is happening for the sake of students. How are we integrating then that academic and social emotional learning so that it's not one or the other, but it's integrated and it's part of what we do. And the last thing I would say in terms of what is innovative, but it's really common sense. It's what Randy and John and I and you have been fighting for for decades. How do we provide then the opportunity for the professionals, the teachers, the principals, those that are doing the work to actually share and collaborate and coordinate the work that they're doing. And we lift best practices, not from a think tank, not from a profit from afar, but from our very own neighborhoods, our very own school yeah. communities. And we lift those up uh, and we adopt them here in our local, local school system. For us, it may not sound like innovative, but for us, that's really innovative. And I would say that the new normal post COVID-19 must never ever look like the pre-COVID-19 normal. We can't go back to suspending kids and using punitive evaluation system and top down. We need to really embrace these new ways of doing the work that we do uh, as we go into a post-COVID-19 world, whenever that is. You know, I really love the way you're emphasizing the collaboration that's going on and the sharing. And if you think about these moments in human history that have been, you know, extraordinary moments, uh, which cause people to have to invent new ways of doing things. It is the sharing of those inventions that is critically important for the, the progress that we make. So really very important. You know, you mentioned uh, the, the lack of um, suspension and, you know, punitive environments, metal detectors, the need for social and emotional supports. John, um, you've been very, very uh, involved in and eloquent about the ways in which we need to think about uh, recalibrating how we work with kids in schools. Could you speak to the uh, issues that you and I spoke about in the, another conversation recently about social emotional learning and restorative practices that are going to be so important? Sure. Well, well my hope is, uh, as Richard said, that, that we do not just return to the pre-COVID status quo, but that we build a stronger, healthier future in our schools. And that means moving away from the use of exclusionary discipline, which is disproportionately applied to students of color. We know, for example, that African-American girls are more than five times as likely to be suspended from school as white female students. Uh, so hopefully we move away from those exclusionary discipline policies towards uh, environments that rely on res restorative justice, but that really create cultures of respect among students and teachers, right? That we invest in kids' socio-emotional well-being, that we rethink dress codes that are disparately applied to girls of color, for example, that we rethink referrals to police of what should be dealt with at school, which disproportionately affects, again, students of color. Um, but when we think about those changes, we have to think about both the culture and discipline changes, but we also have to think about resources. We need more counselors, more mental health services for kids and for families. Uh, student and parent stress is through the roof during this period of COVID-19. We ought to respond to that with additional supports. Uh, Randy mentioned the importance of uh, addressing relationships and building relationships. I would love to see us do what the UK is doing and build a national tutoring corps. Love to see us, uh, Senator Coons has proposed uh, at least double AmeriCorps and create the possibility for uh, tutoring relationships that, that would provide mentoring as well as academic support to students. But there's one other piece I wanna make sure we get in because we focus on the COVID pandemic, but we also have um, as, as Randy and Richard and you have all mentioned, the pandemic of systemic racism that has been with our country from the beginning. And lots of folks put out statements in the spring uh, saying that they believe Black Lives Matter and pledging solidarity with the protesters. But I fear that we have not seen enough action on those 
pledges of solidarity that we haven't yet seen the level of commitment we need to diversifying the teaching profession, which I know is something you're passionate about, Linda. The majority of our kids are kids of color. Only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color. If we believe Black Lives Matter, we need more Black teachers. Um, we haven't, I don't think, yet done the work to rethink curricula and to provide kids with the windows and mirrors that they deserve, opportunities to see themselves reflected in the authors they read, the topics of the text that they study, the history that they learn. Uh, so if you believe Black Lives Matter, then you have to also believe that there's a place for Black authors, Black narratives, Black history in our curriculum. Um, if you believe Black Lives Matter, then you do have to change these discipline policies and you have to think in terms of school cultures that validate every kid's humanity, that help kids feel seen. Think about the fact that we have more than 15 states where there's still corporal punishment. How can we return from COVID to schools where there's corporal punishment, where adults are beating students with wooden objects in an act of state-sanctioned violence? And it's unbelievable. So if we are serious about taking on this pandemic of systemic racism, we have to be very reflective about the things we need to change um, about how schools operate, just as we have to think about how we need to change how uh, all of our institutions operate as a society. Yeah. And, you know, one of those, uh, you gave a wonderful list and mentioned teacher diversity. Um, the other aspect of the educator workforce uh, is that we know that um, kids in um, high minority schools, in high poverty schools, are much more likely to have teachers um, who come in uh, and leave at high rates where there's high turnover, where there's not enough training, not enough support, not enough mentoring you know, for that teacher workforce. And that's causing another, um, we, we do have shortages of teachers. Um, you know, we have uh, both disruptions in the pipeline right now of people coming in and that was already shrinking. And then we have retirements and resignations of teachers, you know, who for a variety of reasons are, uh, you know, just not able or unwilling to continue in the, in the workforce right now. So what do we do about uh, really getting a highly trained, well-staffed, uh, culturally competent workforce you know, in the schools that, that we care about. Randy, would you um, give us sure. a start on that question? Yeah, I look, I think it's actually worse than the retirements and worse than the, um, you know, the, the issues in terms of COVID. I think that the, I think the budget issues are also really terrible here. I think we can get, and again, the, um, the, um, uh, uh, the the president just said that there are not going to be any more negotiations. But I think, let's assume for a second, very quickly, um, uh, era type um, stimulus, um, and part of it has to go for staffing. And the kind of things, for example, that New York City is now doing in terms of having um, you know, basically two or three teachers who were dealing with both remote and in person for a particular class, and they're using a lot of substitutes, but this could actually be, um, and I hasten, I, 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 I'm, I'm a little reluctant to say this, I think if we created um, a residency program and a pipeline and really kind of went to the HBCUs and went to um, some of the state colleges and said, and, and gave people a commitment over a two or three year period of time about really kind of teaching them how to teach, having like master teachers who were helping in terms of both remote and in person, because I think that this is gonna last not only the next semester, but probably another year in, uh, in, in, in a different way than this year, but 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 really kind of front end an investment in teachers, then I think we can both deal with some pipeline issues and diversity issues, but we're gonna have to be able to not just throw the keys at substitutes and say, you know, you, you fit in somewhere. We're really gonna have to figure out how to create mentorship 
and training programs. Um, but the shortage right now, it's the regular, it, I hate to say, it's the regular shortage, Linda, that you've been talking about for so long. Like when we, we talk about, we have 3 million teachers and always over 100,000 in shortage. But we now have the pipeline shortages. We really need to diversify. And we also have the shortages because of, of, of COVID-related related reasonable accommodation of the states that didn't do those reasonable accommodations and people retiring too early and, and creating that kind of brain drain. And then also the, um, the lack of, 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 of money to hire. So that would be something to start for this January, but also something very much to think about with the schools of education and the HBCUs for, um, you know, for starting in September. Yeah, yeah, very important. And you know, he mentioned ARRA, which was the recovery bill at the beginning of the Obama administration. $125 billion was put into stabilizing the educator workforce. So we wouldn't have these huge layoffs. Thus far, we've had $13 billion for all of the needs of K-12 education in the Recovery Act thus far. We have estimates that we probably need two to 300 billion to meet the needs of schools for all of the PPE and uh, physical distancing, et cetera, and to stabilize the educated workforce in terms of, of, of where we're going. You mentioned um, uh, residencies uh, as one strategy and uh, residencies we've seen, you know, bring more teachers of color uh, in get them uh, paid while they're training to teach, uh, put them under the wing of expert mentors and connect their teacher ed coursework to that in a way that they can get a credential in a year uh, without being in debt and go on to get mentoring. Um, Richard, you had um, started such a residency program in San Francisco when you were there. I had the pleasure of working with you on that and have some of that going on in New York as well. And I wonder whether you think that is you know, part of the long-term strategy and, and how else you might want to deal with the workforce issues. Yes, to, to Randy's uh, comment, that, that, that is the way forward, I think. I think job embedded um, residencies not only provide an effective way of recruiting talent, if you will, but it also provides them a very grounded way. And I've seen it firsthand of introducing uh, individuals to our profession in a very grounded way, almost in the apprenticeship model where you have the master teacher uh, you know, imparting the, the strategy and the approach uh, to students uh, that want to be teachers. In the New York City Department of Education, we, we are very, very committed to diversifying our teaching workforce. 82% of our 1.1 million students are Black, Latino, or Asian. They're children of color. So we need to have a workforce that looks like them, that can relate to them, that can also give them uh, those role models for what we want them to be able to do. So one of our highly effective approaches has been the NYC Teaching Academy, uh, where high need, high performing schools uh, that serve as host sites for preparing both traditional uh, teacher candidates from local schools of education, but they also provide alternate routes like our New York, our NYC Teaching Fellows and our NYC Teaching Collaborative. So different pathways for individuals to enter the teaching uh, profession. Uh, in 2015, we also in New York City uh, began an academy model with, get, get this, six schools. Uh, and since then, it's scaled up to more than 100 schools preparing over 600 candidates. Now, when you think about the fact that we hire in a traditional year 6,000 teachers a year, 600 may not seem like a lot. But if you have 600 teachers that are committed, that are teachers of color, then you, we, we want to keep adding to that and how we go forward. We've also recruited and selected and trained uh, teachers to be teacher development facilitators. So we're capitalizing on the expertise of our own teachers here in New York City. Um, we've also worked to really build uh, robust partnerships with local schools of education uh, and collaborating on pipeline development. It includes uh, the New York City Coalition for Teacher Preparation, which is a Gates-funded initiative, uh, but also St. John's University, Long Island University, Hunter College, and of course CUNY. 
Uh, I'll give you just one uh, example of how that's beneficial to us. Uh, in this blended environment, and Randy spoke of this, where you know we're not gonna give a teacher 400 students to work with in a remote learning. That's just crazy. How does a student get any kind of, of, of feedback or, or tangible uh, assistance? But we know at the secondary level where you have a real need for subject matter expertise, in our CUNY system, the City University of New York, we have adjunct faculty that because of the cutbacks there aren't working. Well, if you can have uh, a trained mathematician who can also teach a few classes for us or a trained uh, physicist who can teach some physics classes for you, then it's the city itself helping to support each other. I think in this age, this is the kind of collaboration that we need to really be investing in as leaders of our systems uh, to build a robust pipeline. It's no longer my lane, your lane, here's or her lane, it's our lane. Oh, that's a great, our... Yeah, that's a great point. Um, this hour has flown by and we are almost at the end of it. Um, John, I'm gonna give you the last uh, question here. You were both a state commissioner uh, and a U.S. Uh, Secretary of Education. Uh, what do you think of as the key policy levers that we need to be pushing on to move forward both the reinvention of schools and the greater equity that is so important to us? And I'm gonna ask you to do that in two minutes. <laughs> Well, that's tough because there, there are no silver bullets, but I'll say, look, this is a moment, and, and maybe this is a history teacher in me, but this is a, a New Deal moment for the country yeah. where we ought yeah. to have an ambitious federal response to this moment. Yeah. We ought to triple Title I and in the investment in our highest needs schools. We ought to make a massive investment in diversifying the teaching profession. As Randy said, HBCUs and minority serving institutions are huge providers of teachers of color. Many of our students of color are beginning in community college. We should yeah. be investing there so that those students can become future teachers. Uh, we should be making a massive investment in saving the early childhood sector, which is at risk of complete collapse if there isn't substantial federal investment. We ought to approach access to bandwidth the way the New Deal approached access to electricity. And we ought to make a massive federal investment that says every family needs to have internet access so that their kids can access not only K-12, but higher ed so that folks can look for jobs so that they can access benefits so that they can participate in civic life. And the internet is that vital today, the way electricity was in, in, the, in the mid 20th century. Uh, and then I think we, we need, as you and I have often talked about, Linda, we have to go back and look at why have we yet to fulfill the vision of Brown. More than 60 years later, schools are more segregated by race and class today than they were 20, 30 years ago. That is, that is a national failing, but we could correct that if we were willing to see this as a New Deal moment and we're committed that we should emerge from this period a more just, more resilient, more equitable society in the long run that will also make us a more prosperous society and strengthen our democracy. That's a great point on which to close. Uh, you take us back to the effects of the 60s where in fact we did uh, cut poverty in half in the 1960s. We cut the black-white achievement gap in, by more than half in that period of time. We desegregated schools, we expanded resource equity and we um, undid all of those policies in the 1980s. So the agenda, you know, ahead of us is a new New Deal uh, and a, you know, uh, capitalization on this invention moment that we can uh, use to uh, propel us into the next century, um, just as folks did 100 years ago. Randy, Richard, John, thank you so much. Some of the most important important thinkers on education in the country. We're just thrilled that you could make time. Randy, especially from whatever tour bus you are on, we appreciate we're, it. We're <laughs> actually gonna be, we're actually just going into Topeka, Kansas. All right, <laughs> take us to Topeka. And I'm exactly. going to ask my colleague to close this out with uh, just uh, some information about how people can get follow-up information. Abby? Yes, thanks, Linda. Um, 
So we have a resources here. We just launched a new interactive website for the Restarting and Reinventing School Report that makes it even easier to navigate the different priorities and access the resources that are most relevant to you and your context. Uh, that link is uh, here on the slide. It's also in the chat. And then our panelists also have some wonderful resources that were referenced that are available on their website, shown on this slide. And then all the resources that were shared in the chat will also be available on the event page. And the recording will also be available um, and sent out to everybody by email. And the last thing I'll just say is that a survey will appear in your window when you leave this webinar and we'd really appreciate your feedback. And we hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you.